everyone. Um, so like if everyone's ready, we can start. Um, we can start the panel now. So hi, my name is Rachel. I am one of the co-organizers of Junior Dev, and welcome to our um, our panel. Here we have a very distinguished guests um, here with us today. We have Itch, uh, we have Minchi, we have Akna, and we have Alfonso. Um, yeah. So. Okay, so just to quickly introduce, uh, Itch is a general technologist. Uh, he specializes in healthcare and agri-tech, and he also ma uh, manages the group Product Management Singapore, which is a tech community focusing on product managers and owners. Uh, we have Min Si, who is the principal product manager with consumer experience at Grab, and uh, she has been helping to shape consumer experience at one of Southeast Asia's leading decorons. And currently, she's based in Seattle, and she has worked with many talented developers in her eight-year career across consumer and fintech. And she also has learned that, that with free food and stickers, magic can happen. <laughs> and also with us, we have Archanan uh, Ravi Kumar. She is a lead consultant at ThoughtWorks. Uh, she's a tech lead with experience in retail, microfinance, industry tech, and IoT domains. And she's also proficient in facilitating product design, architecting, applications, leading teams to deliver solutions and coaching individuals and teams. She has worked across different technologies such as .NET, Java, Ruby on Rails, Golang, and Clojure. She's an avid reader, a board game geek, and a coffee addict. And if you wish to follow her on Twitter, it is Arkana, A-R-C-H-A-N-A-A underscore 88. And, if, and also last but not least, we have Alfonso Fior. He is head of product for travel packages at Air Asia. And he has a master's in science and computer science and an MBA from London Business School. So after a long career in telecommunications across Europe, he moved to Asia and started a new career in product management, quickly raising to major Southeast Asian multinationals. And now he has all packaged uh, products in AirAsia, the, the largest Air Asian airline outside of China. And so, yes, welcome everybody. Um, we would be... Um, thank you so much for joining us. And so as I, we would kick off this session with a few um, questions that you no, know, since we are talking about product development, right? So um, for the panel, we just want to uh, say, you no. Know, could you briefly explain what is product development and how is it different from product management, which is probably what more people hear in the industry? Um, does um, Alfonso, do you want to start first? Yeah, sure. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, so I, I think uh, product development is is actually the the actual uh, work that mostly mostly done by engineering and sometimes data scientist team to actually develop the actual product. So so the the app or the website you guys use have been developed by uh, a team of a dedicated Product, uh, dedicated product specialist, engineers, data, data analysts, data scientists, right? Versus product management is uh, basically what, uh, what is more like my role, which is basically understand uh, what type of development will bring value to the, to, to the product based on business requirement, based on feedback from customer, based on uh, looking at competition, uh, and based on experience uh, and understanding of where the business is going and, and what are the latest trends. So business, uh, like uh, product management is more about the definition of the scope of the work and product development is the actual work uh, that takes place to actually make the idea of the product manager reality in the, in the actual app. That's kind of my experience and my idea, but maybe uh, other, other people in the panel and might have a slightly different opinion? Yeah, I think uh, product management, I've, I've seen, I've heard these two terms used interchangeably before, right? So to me, product management is actually a much bigger scope uh, and product development uh, falls under that. So it's like a subset. Um, and of course, these concepts are applied differently depending on which company you go to. Uh, but basically, product management refers to the whole life cycle, right? So um, whereas product development is just a part of it. So if you think about it, you know, product management is about, hey, you know, getting the business justification, you know, doing forecasting and planning, uh, even before 
you start work on developing the product itself. So that's all that work involved. Um, and then you go through the development process and even post development process, um, you know, there's got to be a go to market, you got to launch the product, you got to think of how to market it and eventually maintain it. Or, you know, if it takes too much to, too costly to maintain, you retire it as well. So uh, I would say to me, uh, product development is sort of uh, one of the uh, small fields in which product management covers. Cool. Um, how about Itch and, and Archana? Um, do you have anything else to add to, uh, to what Minsa and Alfonso said? Yeah, I think uh, it's definitely, it's, it's a really good summary of what uh, they've, they've described. So in essence, product management to me is always about the dollar signs, right? So what brings in the money? Development is having that dream and then making it a reality. So there are occasions whereby there could be a cause for conflict whereby product managers are dreaming up of flying pigs, but uh, technology could take around 20 years to reach flying pig status. So it's not really possible. And um, there is some pushback. So uh, most of the time for, for full PM teams, they could have a designer, a PM, and then an engineer. I think no one party really should take uh, more authority over the other. It depends on the realm of where they are at. If it comes down to feasibility, the, to me, the engineer takes precedence. They will make the final call to say go or no go. But if it is a, it is a product that is amazing engineering wise, fully newest specs, and then it doesn't make money, then the PM gets to make the decision and say, it's not making money, go. So, yeah. Um, I think, uh all three of you have covered most of what I had to say, but uh, from the other perspective, like from the perspective of a developer, um, I completely agree with what each said. Um, you have to go like product management and development folks have to go hand in hand. A developer has to understand the priorities of the business and what is the market like and what is the solution that will help us turn things around quickly. And similarly, business has to understand uh, the importance of good technology backing, uh, the importance of a good platform, and they have to go hand in hand to be able to build and deliver a successful product. Uh, yeah, so I think um, also at the same time, it's only two fields. The designers also need to be brought into the picture as well. So I know Straits Times did say artists are not important and non-essential, but you know, they are a very critical part of how a product gets formed. Right, yeah, I agree also. Um, I've, I've done some product management work. Uh, I previously was a QA, so I kind of have been like on like both sides of the spectrum. And I do agree is that you, the product management kind of is the captain of the ship in a way, so it's sort of like directly where you want to go. But if you want the ship to move that way, you still need everyone else to be doing the rest of the work to maintain the ship and make sure the ship actually moves. So yes, I, can't, I really agree with all of you. And also, um, I think this is more for the uh, Arjuna. So it's like, um, when you talk about things like uh, product development, making sure that it works, right? So we've, um, when we were gathering questions uh, from the audience before, of course we asked them, what would you like the panel to speak? Some of them actually brought up something about uh, technical debt. So it's like, how do you, how do you balance, um, I know, technical debt for, say features that have been built previously right. and how they integrate it into um, like building new features or building new products. Because um, I mean, it's like in a company, you'll be working with the same pool of uh, engineering resources. So as a tech lead, how do, you, um, how do you speak with like product managers to integrate um, removing technical debt from the cycle? Yeah. Yep, that's a great question. So, um, so technical debt is like a massive baggage to carry and it's really important to make sure that we pay it back in time. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, it just accumulates and you pay like a lot of interest over time. So um, in my experience, typically what I've done is usually um, when I start like work on a new engagement, I set time with the product folks and we reach an agreement of a certain percentage of time set aside for every sprint or every other sprint where we would spend time clearing up our tech debt. So mm -hmm. that means that um, every other sprint, we'd have like 20% of our time just to clear up tech debt. And this does not just mean uh, we are going to just like, you know, finish off all the tech debt and that's it. 
but as a part of this effort we also continuously look at what are the new tech that that has been introduced we continuously prioritize it uh, maybe something that was really important way long back is no longer that important so we continuously prioritize things uh, we classify them um, into sort of a quadrant right where we talk about what is the effort to clear the tech debt and what is the benefit we get out of it and we mm-hmm. try to get things that give us the most benefit maybe with the least effort first and then we take things as pos- as much as possible um but the first and most important thing is to talk to the product team and the business team to make them understand why it's important to clear off the tech debt because without that we'll never be able to like get the buy in to clear it off and after that conversation it is on the engineering team and the development team to continuously prioritize it and clear it up very cool um so um for h minty and alfonso as product managers um I'm sure you've heard from your own from the tech leads you worked with um in terms of like technical that when you have to balance so like, you know introducing new features or improvements new features or new products and then you have the engineers who say like oh I found this bug so how do you bal- how do you strike the balance yeah uh, I'll go first so I think that usually happens when you need to go to market fast right in a very high velocity environment where you know you just need to build and ship it um and so it's built in a way that's not sustainable or hard to maintain um so you know there are scenarios where we already know sometimes that you know what we're going to build is throw away right it's hacky it's going to be a one time thing and we're going to revise on it so then we make sure to get out the my tech manager that it's it's isolated and that we do remove otherwise if you know in this cases i think what previous speaker said was absolutely right you know we try to a uh, part time in every sprint um so and this, making sure that the product and engineering owners both understand the trade off on both product and engineering if we you know accept this step or not uh, and then parking time to really look at it screen on screen and to either ref- factor or pay back the debt over time. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that the, the mature way of looking at it, like you have to incur it sometimes, um, but it's how you uh, pay it back <laughs> um, that sets you up for success later. So I have, a, I have a different philosophy to this as well. So let's just say if uh, we go with MVP, we go with a no code solution, at the end of the day, like what Minty is saying, it's going to be throwaway code. I would not allocate any time to deal with it at all. It will just run its course and die. Mm-hmm. The other item is also, if I'm looking at the bigger picture, my company is going to be acquired because of shit how much tech that there is i'm selling off the company right <laughs> okay i see i could have like what what the hell is going on but you know in the grand scheme of things um if you know down the road 3 to 6 months down the road it's going to get acquired by say some big ass corporate company eh, why keep the product in a way such that the the big ass corporate companies are not going to spend effort to develop the product any further it's going to die anyways so this is this is my really bitter experience from the past but um at the same time i think uh for most engineers they also have the pride whereby they will clear up the debt on their own so i i do think that most of the time i try to just let them be uh they set up their own schedule and they run their course i would have new features or user stories i'll load onto them and then they'll let me know if they can finish or not um I think the other thing is debt is not necessarily a bad thing. It's like the US. They can have 20 trillion dollars in debt and they're still the richest con- country in the world. So sometimes it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's okay. What can we eat today? It's okay. Someone is going to buy it. <laughs> yes, <try>. yes, exactly. <laughs> Ooh. All right. <laughs> well, I think another way to look at it it's um, it's basically to me actually when I when I hear about about this I I find this is one of the, the perfect examples that that tells me that it's very, very important for an organization to be successful, to have product and, and tech very much at the same level, right? Because I don't think it works where when product uh, reports into tech, and I don't think it works if tech reports into product. And 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 I think it's because it, it's, it's really like this kind of um, uh, trade-off, right? Like like um, Minsi correctly said, right? It's, it's, really, uh, it's really about trade-off. And I think I, I'd like to add on top of what uh, Archana said is that I think it's important to understand the value of what the of what the cleaning that 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 will bring, right? So I know that sometimes uh, some companies, especially in in moments of of trouble, they they kind of set this this kind of metrics of like you know ten percent, twenty percent. But honestly, I kind of challenge that, right? I want to really understand what is the value that is going to bring, and is it going to make us faster, or we're going to do it just because we want to do it, or just because you know. 
uh, engineers have a certain kind of uh, like like uh, like we said, right? They they are proud of their work, which is great, right? But at the same time, we are we are here to make money. We are not here to create a fantastic architecture, or we are here like you know at, at least uh, in normal businesses, right? Unless you're you're working for Google with three hundred billion dollar in the bank and you can afford to do some things just to make them beautiful, right? But Normally, 99% of businesses, they, they really have to compete with a lot of competition. So, you know, it, it's very difficult for, for, for a company to justify a certain investment if there, is an, if there is no return on that investment, right? So the idea is really understand what are the trade-offs, what, what is it that we are uh, going to pay down the, down the line if we don't fix it. And to be honest, I think in reality, when I look at, look at the experience I had in the past, there has always been much more tech debt than everybody wanted. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, sometimes you have to go down that path just because you have competition, you have a lot of pressure. And this is how mm, oftentimes uh, we have to roll uh, in, in, in the competitive environment that we're facing uh, in the market. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think sometimes it's very hard you know, to convince business, right? That, hey, you know, we're going to not ship, we're going to start work for two weeks because we need to fix this debt. <laughs> and they, they, they if you don't understand tech, you know, they don't understand what has to be done. So I would say as product owners or uh, engineers, you know, if you want to help solve this problem, you know, help, uh, what we've done good at is communicating and quantifying in a way where it affects efficiency and hence uh, business profits. So, you know, really putting that dollar value on it. Uh, I think that's what uh, product owners have to do as well. So I think to make it a bit more tangible as well, right? It's like the trace together app. Previously, before uh, Apple and Google open sourced, now that they've open sourced, will they go with the option to take the open uh, open specs or will they go down the path of developing their own, right? So this is this is definitely some consideration that um, I think GovTech is, is discussing. Uh, I haven't gone through the full GitHub repo myself, but I know my friends are like all the fuss, like, oh, there's open standards already. Why are we still wasting time? So, you know, there, there will be incurred cost to migrate over to uh, open standard as well. So would that would that be justified, and, and would the product owner want to make that call after sinking in so much money? Interesting, interesting that you brought it up. So it's like um, you mentioned about things like migrating of technologies, um, like for the so especially for like software engineers, since most of the time software engineers usually they have like uh, uh, they're more in touch with like know what's the latest uh, technology um, like advancements, whether certain things, like example the uh, Apple and Google open, so open sourcing so that governments can use it uh, in the COVID-19 situation, right? So, um, like for Arjuna, is it very difficult as a tech lead to bridge the gap between the engineers who are working with and under you um, and product or other aspects of the tech business, say those in sales and marketing or the UX designers? Is it very difficult for you to bridge the gap? Um. It's, it's definitely a challenge, I'd say. Uh, but it's usually because uh, people have come from different places with different contexts. Mm -hmm. And as long as the goals are not aligned, it's always a hard sell. So as an example, um, as others, other panelists mentioned, sometimes the business is always chasing the numbers and we have like really uh, strong market pressure and we want to launch new features and deliver stuff. Um, and... For whatever reason, we might have chosen a technology stack which might not be as new or cutting edge as the developers would like it. And developers and engineers on the team are often quite interested in learning new technology and keeping themselves up to date. And very often I see that as a point of uh, conflict, even though it doesn't really directly involve a conflict because uh, many times business or product teams wouldn't understand what the fuss is all about and developers wouldn't understand why we can't like go and trial out a new technology. So mm -hmm. oftentimes it's because people come from different contexts and um, a lot of the times it comes down to like sitting down and having like a really open talk with people. But many times I have seen that uh, um, as long as, so as a tech lead, my principle is usually to give like certain high level guidelines and boundaries. And as long as people operate within that, it's still okay. Um, if you give like a choice of three or four technologies to your team, and if you are okay with those three, four options, if they are still safe bets, and if they chose to go with one of the three or four, it's still okay. It's not too much of a gamble. So they get mm -hmm. like the, you know, the experience of choosing what they would like to work out of those four technologies, mm -hmm. but still you've chosen like uh, something that's maybe relatively safe. Um, the flip side of this is to make sure that you don't, um, you know, kill innovation in your team. 
just by being like rigid and strict about what to use what not to use and just always chasing the goals and numbers you have to make sure that you don't kill innovation in your team so as a tech lead it's really important to balance between the two to make sure your team's learning enough growing and you know their career they are uh, growing in their career while also contributing effectively to the product development mm. right i understand um so yeah i mean speaking of the technology stacks right i mean even even things like uh cobol is still very much in play with banks it is a super old technology so would that be considered tech debt probably right for for most sane people they should have migrated out the code long ago but <laughs> so that that can be argued so newer fintech banks like monzo they're fully building it on golang which is great it's fast it's got the it's got the uh, the speed and efficiency of of cobol and c code so i think in in that aspect how the company grows and how they grow out the product is as important as the tech stack and over time it will be legacy it will be old but it will still work so it's also very important to gauge what is considered tech debt in that regard is an older technology stack considered a tech debt in my view probably not it will still work i think it depends on the context right it's just exactly like what you said so if it's a product that's going to be sold or if it's a product that's going to that we are not going to add any features to it's just going to stay there like a piece of furniture then we probably not change it at all we'll not upgrade it we'll let like the sleeping dogs lie but usually in my experience um there's a couple of things one is more and more companies are beginning to realize that technology is also an asset to the organization so it's not just what buildings you own and what vehicles or resources you own technology is also becoming a part of the assets so when you sell the technology that you own actually becomes a huge part of the deal right the negotiation like do you own a platform do you have like an open source platform do you own like an in house platform is it plug is it like in a plug and play model can it be extended all those questions come into play the second question is uh, so in my experience so i worked 11 years as a software developer and in my experience i have not met like a single client who said um, you know what this this platform we're done with it we don't want to enhance it anymore we're going to throw it away let's build something from scratch everybody almost always wants to enhance the existing platform so that's why the question of tech debt becomes really important because nobody really thinks of their platform as something like in very rare cases they think of it as throw away but it's really in early stages if you've invested two or three years into a product or a platform then there's like very low chance that you're going to throw it away and that's why it's important to keep it like well groomed fit and robust um So maybe I can I would just raise a question as well. If there is a legacy product, take for instance Lotus Notes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Would it make sense to even bother um clearing out the tech debt or just build features on top? Um right. So it depends on where your business is heading. So let's say you have a solution built on top of Lotus Notes. and it's something that you want to continue keeping alive and delivering new features to but it's also not scalable and you're not able to like add more users you like just struggling to meet with your competition then we would talk about how we can migrate features from the lotus note setup to some new setup while keeping both things alive at the same time and it's like a really complicated process so what people compare this the analogy is like performing a heart surgery when the patient is still alive and awake right yeah. it's like that right you're moving like an existing business you're transplanting it but mm-hmm. if it's something if in some cases it's like the business has decided that they want to change their business model they want to try something completely new in that case there is no point in like replacing the old one at all you just like invest in building a new one and then you just like decommission the old one so i guess it depends on the context okay um alfonso you uh, do you have anything to add um i think it's it's uh, i i basically i i think there were made there were very good example made right of edge cases of situation which were which are a bit extreme right and there is also the the situation of the opposite right i know of businesses that have failed just because they refocused on changing their technology stack and they kind of lost touch with the market and lost touch with with what actually was going on right with the competition mm-hmm. So it's a it's a everything right I mean I mean it's never nothing is ever black or white right it's always a scale of gray and now you have to really realize what's the right answer for your particular business for your particular situation 
you know, in, 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 in my past, for example, we had a situation where we had to kind of uh, build, uh, rebuild a new technology, a new stack, and it was very painful. I mean, the business owner were, were very much, uh, you know, not uh, like Mincy was saying, right? You know, it's difficult for them to understand what is it really there. They want to have numbers, so you have to come up with, with certain ideas of what can be, what will be the, the, the results of this change, but you don't really know. Um, so you, you just have experience that tells you that, you know, uh, for example, a very fast uh, performing uh, uh, page will, will actually um, have better conversion, let's say, for example, of a, of a slow converting page. But at the end of the day, right, uh, you, you, you basically still face all these uh, all these um, issues of convincing all the stakeholders to, to actually uh, allow you that kind of two, three months, because sometimes when even a, a small rebuild kind of cost, costs a lot of time, right? So um, I, I, I think, uh, again, what our China said is correct, right? You know, you have to find a way to bring those two things at the same time, kind of leave like have the old one alive and, and maybe being able to kind of do a short, a, a simple MVP, uh, to, to show that the performance and, and the potential of the new technology and moving, moving it on uh, a little bit at a time. So I think as, as in many, many things in product management and in product in general, I think one of the big skills when we talk about technology and technological stack is how can we make this smaller, right? Uh, now we can probably have a conversation for the next uh, two hours about the meaning of minimum viable product, moving it to minimum lovable product. We, we have like, a, you know, a lot of like a thousand articles being written on these arguments, right? So hopefully we're not going to go down that path. But I mean, at the very high level, right, the logic goes that what can you do to move to something else without rebuilding the entire castle from the foundation all the way to the pinnacle and the flag at the top of the pole, right? What can you do? to make something move uh, to the new technology without uh, having to pause the entire business for six months or one year, because that would be a cost that the business would not be able to pay and would more likely uh, fell off the cliff compared to competition. Customers would not understand why nothing is changing for so long and why their needs are not answered for so long. And so eventually the business will, will pay a big price, right? Yeah, that's true. Uh, Rinse, anything else to add? Yeah, no, I think uh, the other panelists have really covered uh, this topic quite well. I mean, I would say, you know, tech stacks, these trends come and go, right? I would say they're trends. And the same way I look at design trends as well, you know, like um, you have different navigation principles introduced by the OSs like time and time again. Uh, it doesn't mean that this trend is working. Like you got to figure out really what's best for your company and your business. Right. So, I mean, look at the whole React Native thing <laughs> for a while, you know, everyone was going to it and then Facebook did a major uh, turnaround and they have a very good blog post on it. So, you know, we went through a mini version of it ourselves and I've also been in that position where we had to, you know, re-architect an app from the entire, <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, all over again and rewrote it in Kotlin afterwards, you know, we really looked at and said, hey, you know, was it worth it? <laughs> right. So I think it's really, you know, regardless of trends and what comes out, it's really uh, figuring out, hey, at the moment in time for your business and your audience and, you know, where you're headed, uh, is that the best option? Right. And if I can add something that, that uh, means you reminded me, right, is it's a comment that I've heard from a fellow product manager a couple of years back. And I think it's actually very apt when we talk about uh, technologies, right? And she said to me, like, you know, you know what I do? At the beginning, I was like, you know, a blue-eyed product manager, always want to make everybody happy, always thought that it would, possible, it would be possible to, be, to, to make everyone happy, which is actually the first, you know, life lesson of a product manager. Everyone will hate you no matter what you do. And, uh, and basically, uh, she said, like, uh, at the beginning, you know, when, tech, when the, my tech team, my dev engineers, my developer, uh, would come and ask me about new technology, I would always be like, oh, yeah, yeah, we can, because of course they would always sell it like uh, the next, the next big thing uh, from sliced bread, right? So they would be like, oh, this would be solve all our problem. It would be so much faster. And then basically she did it, she did it a couple of times and, and she quickly realized the price, like uh, was, Mincy was, was mentioning, for example, with React Native, right? And so basically she came up with this kind of uh, mental algorithm, which I think is actually quite, quite interesting and quite, uh, I mean, it's probably what every product manager applies, but she made it out, she, she, she said it out loud, which is like, you know, never be the first, never be the last, right? Because being the first to move to something new, you, you're going to pay all the price and you're going to be the, the one like finding all the problem and all the pitfalls. 
if you're the last, you're going to pay all the price of not having support and having few people to, to help you out in a certain things. Just be snuggled in the middle uh, with, the, with a big chunk of people moving from one thing to the next, and then you're kind of in a safe place, right? That's, that's kind of the way she put it, and I think it's actually very smart. But I would think that that is definitely for more incumbent industries. If you're in cutting edge industries, it may not be a luxury that you can afford. It might need to push the envelope for more cutting edge technologies in my view. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree, right? I mean, if you, if you hear like, uh, I think uh, there is a very famous quote for product managers from, from Marty Kagan, right? And he said that, you know, if you only use your engineer to code, you use only half of their capacity, right? which I think is very true and, and it's amazing. Like, I don't know if you see, for example, a uh, certain technology that was developed by Airbnb uh, when, they, when they had some technological problem that nobody has solved before, or I mean, of course, the, the Googles and the Facebook of the world, but even Airbnb uh, developed some, some uh, new frameworks that were not available uh, because nobody has ever faced those problems and no, probably nobody in Silicon Valley has ever faced those problems because I don't think that uh, Airbnb f faced any any problem different than all the you know um, Agodas or or Booking.com or Trip.com of the world, right? But because they were the first one of this kind in Silicon Valley, probably they kind of also had a different approach to it. And it's true that you're totally right, right? They really built new new ideas, new technology, new frameworks that were not available before. So I, I I'm sure depending on where you are in in uh, the the basically the the lifetime of, of your product, the lifetime of your competition, you, you, you can always do something more, right? It's just about, you know, is it a, is it a company or is it a product that is, like you said, right, is, is trying to be on the cutting edge of technology or is it more of a product that is trying to answer a specific need of a customer in the cheapest possible way to, to maximize return for investors and, and then you simply want to be a little bit more um, safe with your technology uh, solutions. Thanks so much for sharing, everyone. So, so we actually have a few questions that are coming up um, on pigeonhole. So, uh, pardon me, I'm just trying to You're looking at a top voted question, and now I see you guys have some issues. Yeah. So, so, so I'm, oh, it's the product owner one. That one I'm really happy with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so we have a few questions um, that we would probably do. Uh, the one that Jenna has asked. So since technical capability or understanding is the concern for PM and engineering teams to come together to an agreement on the development process, do you see a possibility of a merge role? For example, like PM and software engineer combined. I would actually challenge the premise of this question, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's true that, that the product manager is particularly uh, worried about the, the the technical the technical means, right? The, the the mantra is that the product manager talks about the the what, and the engineering manager talks about the how, right? So I I honestly don't believe. In fact, actually, I think the product manager role should be split in five different roles because it's so much work, right? So definitely, I'm not going to take any more any more uh, work uh, on top of that, right? I don't think it's realistic, right? So I, I, I mean, it doesn't make any sense, right? It's, it's so, much, uh, so much time, so much uh, skills different. Of course, I'm sure that there are some, uh, some you know, unicorns which are able to do multiple things. Like, for example, where I work, uh, the CTO uh, that was just, uh, a, a colleague was just uh, um, moving to the CTO role and he used to be a head of product, right? So, that's clearly like a talented person that has both product and, and technology abilities. But I, I don't think I met that many people that would be capable to do, to do those things. So I, I don't really believe that this is a good idea from, from, from my perspective. So I think from, from my point of view is that there are technical PMs. Uh, they have a much better ability to discuss with engineers the type of technology, the type of technology stack, architecture. Uh, coding wise, I haven't seen the guys who can really do it uh, that well for a technical PM, but they're able to speak the same lingo. Minimally, they can open up Terminal and look like a legit programmer. <laughs> right. Um, that being said, I think it's also trends. So maybe a few years ago, data science was the big thing. 
right? Everybody rushed into it. They all knew how to, to code in Python and R, and then R has kind of died down. Now everybody's in Python. Now with product management, it's kind of picked up uh, hype and steam and, you know, in, in the Gartner curve, uh, there's a lot more hype around it and just waiting pe for people to die off. Um, I, I, I think at the end of the day, depending on whether you're looking at it from a career perspective or from an individual standpoint to come out to do your own company and your own startup, it doesn't hurt to pick up new skills. It doesn't hurt to learn new things and increase and scale up in different areas. But at the same time, what the market is going to pay you in terms of the skills if you are a technical person that is better at doing PM and there are more PM jobs, your tech skills will not be paid. If you are a uh, tech engineer with some PM skills and there's more need for engineers, your PM skills may not be paid because of market conditions. So unless market conditions dictate that there's going to be a need for super technical PMs, if not like what Alfonso says, there may not be a shift in that particular uh, job scope or job title. Um, Lindsay, you have anything to add? No, I think um, they covered it well. So, I mean, I do interact with my, uh, it's actually the same premise as Alfonso, right? I interact with my engineers the same way in where I'm responsible for articulating the why uh, and what, uh, and then, you know, I rely on them for the how. And we come into discussion when, you know, the how doesn't really meet the why. Uh, or the what in terms of timelines, et cetera. So, um, but you know, to what you said, there are really roles that exist like this today, you know, where uh, fields that are so specialized and so technical that it would be best to have a PM with that technical expertise and background driving it. Um, so, you know, I, I would say uh, it, it really depends again on the scope and the field. Um, mm -hmm. But there are roles that exist like that today. But uh, generally, uh, for the most part, um, uh, you know, they, they look after different sides of the equation. Right. Um, Ajana, I, anything else to add? Yeah, so I think there's like two parts to this question. So the first part is um, for developers and engineers to be successful in whatever they're trying to implement, they have to understand the business and the product side of things. They have to understand it. So many times, like when we are coding and we don't know what's the right name to give to a variable or a service or anything, we actually ask the product managers, what do you talk about this as? What is this used for? And we try to make sure that we use the business terms to define our variables in our code. Um, so that, you know, uh, everybody, the engineering team, the product, and everybody's talking the same language and they're talking about the product as one. So that's one part. The flip side, I think, and might be slightly controversial, is that I think it is helpful for product folks uh, to understand like the really bare building blocks of technology. So you don't have to be able to code. I think it's okay. Uh, but, you know, to understand what the service is and what the front end is and what an API call is, because uh, that way you'll be able to understand the cost of making changes, right? If you want to push something new to production and you understand, okay, it's a change in the service, so it's slightly more costly, or we have to upgrade the app version so it's more expensive, um, or it is a database call, so it might take a slightly longer time. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that understanding also helps and it's useful, but I don't think it's mandatory. Like I've seen PMs slowly pick this up and if they have that understanding, it's definitely very useful. Yeah, and I will add to that and say that, um, so the, the example I was going to bring up was Stripe, right? So Stripe is a very engineering led company and actually they are, they are lead engineers take on the role of PMs, right? I think they only started hiring PMs in the last year or so. Um, so when you talk to them, you know, they are like looking at business cases, they are like figuring out which direction, what tag to build next, uh, which product feature to build next, right? And mm -hmm. uh, some of them, you know, if I look at that, wow, that's a superpower, right? Because you can do everything, but uh, it doesn't mean that they're happy doing that, right? It's a, some of them are like, hey, this is not the role I signed up for, um, because product management also requires a whole different set of skills, right? Stakeholder management, you gotta, you know, influence. Um, so uh, it's, I mean, I think those roles do exist, but, but it's about whether you uh, see yourself fitting into that. Right. Um, thanks so much for answering this question. So we will move, we'll be moving on to a question that was asked by Anonymous, which um, might be a bit controversial for for the PMs. Very controversial. Yeah. Very normal. So the question by Anonymous is, what can I do if my product owner is not performing well? For example, not for giving unclear or shifting requirements and not articulating a vision. And I think it also, in a way, it ties in with a separate question that a different Anonymous has posted, which is like, what should the skills that a developer, what kind of skills does a developer need to know when communicating with product managers? 
So I'll just combine these two questions together into one, and then um, whoever is ready to answer can just uh, speak first. Yeah, I'll take the first one. I think this is uh, quite straightforward, right? And it may be hard, but to me, whether your product owner is not performing well, whether engineering manager, whether your peer is not performing well, um, the approach is the same, right? It's to give them honest and active feedback. Um, so, you know, we're all humans and we're all learning. And the only way um, to improve and better ourselves is to, uh, you know, is to know <laughs> from someone else. So in, in this case, it's just a matter of um, sitting down with your PM 101 and saying, hey, you know, uh, or just calling them out for it, right? Uh, and saying that, hey, you know, this has shifted or, you know, you keep changing or you keep adding new scope. It's not going to work well. Uh, or I don't see where this product uh, is going. Can you share with me the roadmap and vision? Put the onus on them um, to resolve that because that's their job. Um, so I, I will really emphasize this because I'm only as good as the engineering managers I've worked with. Right. Um, and you know, they have sat down with me and they have pushed me and you know, they have given product feedback uh, and it helped me to think about things uh, from a different perspective and different path. And in that, in that way, really, you know, really hone my expertise as well. Um, so, you know, this is the best uh, favor that you can do uh, for them and for yourself. Um, so I would say just, you know, really being very uh, transparent uh, with your feedback. Well, I think a PO versus a PM, especially with regard to... Uh this sounds like something out of the government, in my view. <laughs> is it? All right. So the, the, I don't know who the hell anonymous is. So I think it's best safe to keep it anonymous for now. Um, and the PO in itself, especially for bigger organizations that I've been through, most of the time control the budget to pay for the whole team. They are the client. And yes, there are times that they seem like incompetent people. And if given a choice, Ms. Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous, if you don't need to work for the client, time to go because it could be very difficult and very frustrating in the long run. Um, the other thing that could be done is, of course, to force prioritize features and backlog. Because um, a lot, like at least from my experience, a lot of times these folks come from a waterfall implementation. The way they run Agile is rapid, for, for, for lack of a better word, right? That, that, is, that is the best they can do. And there's, there's, no, there's no fault in that, especially in healthcare. I think I would still prefer a waterfall approach whereby things are quite fixed. I know when I'm gonna push things into production. Um, I know what the technology is, I'm very comfortable. And if the PO, like uh, in, in the case, I think I did this a few years ago for the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. It was a temporary code that's still sitting in hospitals today. The PO just came up to us like, we need it two days ago. Like, right. <laughs> what do you expect me to do, right? So it, it does happen that they don't have clear or shifting requirements because their bosses are also unclear and shifting. And, you know, it's, it's just trickling down from the top. And in cases like that, one um, running a workshop to align everybody once a month could be useful to make sure everybody speaks the same lingo, like what Arjuna was saying. Everybody has the same context. Everybody has the same lingo. Everybody understands the same word the same way. Right? There's no ambiguity as to what is being asked for. That is extremely important in these cases because the unclear or shifting requirements could just essentially be the same thing, but in different words. And that causes a lot of confusion. Um, and if, like, I'm, I'm taking this as a PO and not the PM, and I agree with Mincy, if there is uh, some, some, some conflict within the team for the PM, the designer, and the engineer, there's weekly retros for most teams, and that should be brought up in a safe environment to discuss it openly. Uh, but the PO may or may not attend these retros all the time. And if this is the case, I think it would be advisable for the PM to have a comfortable coffee session in a safe environment. The book I would strongly recommend is something called uh, Crucial Accountability. I think that has helped me and it was recommended to me by my mentor. It's been very useful to build a safe space to discuss very uncomfortable topics, especially when it comes down to the PO not taking charge of what they're supposed to do. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I think for Alfonso and Archana, right, since uh, Alfonso, you have been a software engineer previously, and Archana, you're still um, you're being a tech lead. And so it's like, what, do, what kind of advice would you give like, to, the, to the junior devs in the audience? Yeah, so I, I actually wanted to, to cover that part of the question uh, when you said that you wanted to kind of merge the two, right? I think mm -hmm. one challenge is that uh, obviously 
product managers and engineers uh, and developers are, are hired for different skills naturally because they do different jobs. Uh, and so naturally product managers are uh, a bit better at, at um, explaining their, their arguments or their opinions. And in, in my experience uh, for certain uh, engineer that could be a little bit sometimes challenging. And so definitely I think it's important for, uh, for engineers to really uh, you know, uh, try to make clear exactly what their point is. So I totally agree with what we, what was said earlier. Uh, give direct feedback. Uh, try as much as possible not to kind of uh, have a uh, public scene and just try to kind of uh, directly uh, talk to the product manager. Um, but I would say like every story is a little bit different, right? Uh, I, now, if you if uh, if you allow me to quote, uh, like to misquote actually, Anna Karenina, right? All happy product managers are happy in the same way, but each unhappy product manager is unhappy in, in his or her own particular way, right? So what I'm trying to say here is that there could be a million reasons why you see shifting priorities. It's because uh, the, the most common reason is that, to be honest, we talk about product management. As we said, it's really a hype title nowadays, but in reality, uh, in, 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 my, in my own experience for in large companies, I, I've worked in a few, I only uh, work in a single uh, uh, company that I could really say it's a product uh, driven organization, right? So a lot of time, you know, there are, there are companies where uh, you have a lot of stakeholders, sometimes behind the scene, sometimes they're kind of like uh, gray in the, in, the, in the background and then they pop up at a certain point just to dictate what they want from a product, even though- Incredible. You were never, you never even knew that they were there. And, and so basically sometimes the product manager against his or her uh, will, right? They have to kind of make a last minute change because they are not really in control. If you, if you talk about a product driven organization, then the product manager is really accountable for his or her own KPIs and really drives the product forward. But a lot of times, you know, we pay lip service to product management, but in reality we have all sorts of uh, business leader, business manager, product marketing managers, all sorts of weird, uh, strange uh, other roles that, that uh, seem to be uh, or believed to be accountable as well for business KPIs. And so it becomes very difficult for the, for the product manager to really have a clear, uh, unified vision and really bring the product forward. So I think this is also part of the problem. And, you know, let's um, be Sorry, honest. Alfonso, I think the, the audio is a bit choppy on your end. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, anyway, so what I was trying to, to say is that there are many, many reasons why things, this, this can happen. And sometimes like Mincy was saying, right, we are all humans. We, we, we really need to learn, but in terms of like the development uh, in terms, in terms of the developer, right. It's really important. I think to be, to try to be as clear as possible and to have, uh, like we said in previous, in previous points that we discussed, right trying to really bring it back to the return on investment, to the impact to the product, because for, for a product manager, it's going to be really difficult to understand, oh, you know, uh, you have to, you know, like if we tie it back to other answers, right? When we talk about product debt, that kind of stuff, right? It's going to be difficult for the product manager to understand, you know, what's the impact? So what, right? So as we mentioned in other questions, uh, in other answers that we had previously, I think the most important thing from a developer perspective is try the best you can, as much as you can, to speak the language of the product manager so that the product manager can really understand uh, why you're concerned and, and how can you, you know, how can he or she incorporate your feedback into the, into the roadmap? Because at the end of the day, the product manager just wants what's best for the product, uh, given the feedback, given the, the business KPIs, and, and given the, the, the feedback also from the engineers, right? So unless you're really working with a sociopath and then I'm really sorry for that, but ideally the, the feedback you get uh, will be heard and, and will be improving uh, the, the product that you're working on. Great, thanks for sharing. Um, Archana? Um, I think most of the points have been covered. I just have like a couple of um, things people can try if uh, giving feedback and other things are not working out. So assuming that the person has the right intentions and the changing or shifting requirements are something that's not in their control. Um, some things that have worked for me in the past are first, um, you could try to get like a clear product spec out 
which everybody looks at and everybody gives like their verbal agreement to saying, okay, this looks right, this looks about right. So that at least like the bare bones of the feature that you're building is somewhat agreed upon. And if that's not possible, you could simply start um, tracking what is the delta, what's, how much is the change that we're talking about. So, uh, you know, typically the functionality that you're building would be in like a Jira card or like somewhere on like, um, I don't know, a Jira or Asana or Trello or somewhere. So you start recording uh, every change to that as a separate card. So usually what happens is the functionality gets put into a Jira card maybe and somebody gives an estimate saying it's a two point or a three point to implement this. And then let's say that requirements are changing or something changes. You don't do it as a part of the same card. You record it separately, estimate it for it separately so that when you do a retrospective, you will be able to retrospectively look back and see how much is the change and what is the effort that you've lost because of this. So maybe that, um, you know, allows the team to have a conversation about how to make things better and what can be done to avoid this. Maybe that gives the product owner uh, things to think about in terms of cost. Okay, this is the developer effort that was lost because of this. And maybe there are better ways to do this. Yeah, I really echo that. It's like, keep your PM honest, right? So sometimes uh, I'm guilty of it myself. I try to slip stuff in <laughs> during the screen. My engineers don't let me do that. You know, they just don't take the tickets. I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> and and that, that, that's perfectly fair because we need to protect our, um, our burnout chat as well. Right, I see. So, okay, we will be moving on to the next question. Um, so we have... Maybe since you mentioned that product managers and uh, product owners are a bit different, maybe we can just um, sort of quickly um, explain this question just to make it clear before we move on to another one. What's the difference between a product manager versus product owner uh, versus project manager? Mm. So it's like because um, even for myself, um, when I speak with different companies, I also realize that uh, certain companies' definitions are a bit different. And then some, um, the title is A, but the job scope is actually uh, someone else's definition of B, and so on and so forth. So maybe um, you can just uh, briefly explain what are the differences? Yeah, I think, uh, and this is actually the answer right there, is that they are differently used across uh, various companies, right? From, from Microsoft to Google to Facebook um, to Grab or to wherever it is. I think they all have their own definitions of what uh, uh, product is in these companies and different roles to fulfill on that, right? So, for example, the Grab role in product, uh, you know, the, the sorry, the Grab product role is... Uh, there's there's also a TPM, there's also a product marketing person, there's product analytics, and all of that together sort of make up product management. So um, different companies break this up in different way. So I've been, so I'll try to tackle this. Uh, I've been mm -hmm. both on a product management side and also a technical program manager side. Uh, conventionally, uh, the difference between the two is that, you know, a product manager really does all of this, uh, you know, that we're talking about, right? Looks at product KPIs and performance, you know, you know, ships features to improve that data and bring business value. Uh, whereas a technical project or uh, program manager looks more at meeting timelines. So coordinating between teams in a very big uh, uh, company, like they're not responsible for the metrics or the success, right? You know, uh, it's like, as long as you meet the deadlines, the product fails, that's not the product manager. <laughs> but the, the project manager really looks at, hey, how do I unblock uh, all these barriers? How do I bring teams together? Um, uh, do you know, how do I keep everyone on track and according to the milestones that were identified? So uh, at the core, there's a difference between a product manager uh, and a project manager. And I know this is really confusing. A lot of uh, engineers ask all the time, what's the difference between the work that we do? Uh, but the product person really looks at overall success, uh, whereas the project manager tracks to uh, delivery uh, given deadlines. Um, and as for, you know, between a product manager and product owner, again, used interchangeably in different places. Um, the most, the usual distinction is that, you know, uh, in companies where they say you are a product owner, you actually do have uh, control or ownership of the P&L. Right, so the business side of the product. Uh, whereas uh, in uh, product management and conventional, you know, you have some uh, uh, direct or indirect impact to some metrics, but you don't actually own um, the P&L and being able to, you know, uh, uh, play around with the numbers uh, or the revenue and cost as you will. So that, that's the differences that I've seen so far. Mm -hmm. Anything else to add from the rest of the panel? Yeah. Um, 
maybe echo what what means to say and, and i feel like there are as many definition are there are companies under the sun and i know for example a, a company that that one day decided that all their product owner would then next morning be called product managers so uh, honestly i think it's i think you should be more uh, you as in you a potential um, uh, person that is joining a company you should more be more concerned about what the what is the definition for the company you're about to join rather than kind of understanding a overarching difference of the two roles because uh, many companies treat those words those names uh, interchangeably many companies change their their definition and many companies use the same word for for to mean different things mm. right yeah so i think for project management it is quite clear cut so there is a project management institute and you can get a nice pmp title by paying a certain amount of money and taking the crappy test right so you can put it at the end of your name so that that's i think that's definitely quite clear cut um, views of time, finance, as well as uh, resource and scope. Um, PM wise, like product management wise, um, I think the terminology in itself is not as important like Alfonso says. It really boils down to the culture of the company and how they run it. Because if, if they can't even agree upon something as simple as say, how you define agile, <laughs> it just becomes quite tough. Right, and, and how they run the backlog. Um, yeah, I, I think there has been cases whereby uh, some corporates, because they want to go agile, and then they're like, okay, everybody just becomes a product manager. And then after that, okay, uh, functional specs are now being cut into user stories. Like, huh, why? <laughs> but it's still gonna be delivered and then repackaged into a functional spec again. So to me, that, that is just insanity. Like, you know, have some respect as to what the original philosophy was meant for, and then stick to your guns. If you think waterfall is great, yeah, it's okay. It will still run, right? But um, I think there's, there's certain upper management or senior managers that feel that, okay, I need to take the new management flavor of the day and then churn this out as, as the new culture. And I think that's very, very dangerous. Right. Um, okay, if there's nothing else to add, we can move on to... Um, to the last few questions. Um, so now that we've already defined what, uh, what like a difference between product manager, product owner, and uh, project manager, right? So we would also, um, for those who are like tuning in and are curious, right? We can, um, some of them will have also asked, like, you know, how do you become a product manager? Should product managers come up through the engineering side or the business side? Uh, because um, for a lot of the Fang companies, so for those who are not, who don't know, Fang stands for Facebook, Amazon, uh, Apple, uh, Netflix, and Google. So these are the, the tech giants. Usually, a lot of those who become product managers, um, they usually start off with like an MBA. But then, because a lot of us, a lot of the audience here are junior developers, so um, you know, all very curious is like, if let's say I start off as a software engineer. Um, should I continue this path towards becoming a PM or should I study something business related and then become a PM? So Anyone want to go first? Okay. I, I think there are a lot of boot camps whereby after three months you become a PM. <laughs> um, of course, I, I don't really agree with, with that stance right on that route. Um, it's just like if you want to become a CEO, you can pay Acura 300 bucks, register a company and you're instantly a CEO. So the term in itself is not important, but the ability to deliver on the skill set is. So what does it entail to become a product manager, especially for the organization that you tend to join? And I think a lot of the, the younger folks that I've spoken to is that um, they'll say, oh, uh, there's this requirement. I need to have five years of product management experience, but if I can't even become a product manager, how do I get to five years? Um, my general advice is to find somebody to mentor you for two reasons. One, they can guide you through all the jargon that's required, you know, all the things to say in the interview if you do end up getting the interview. Secondly, they would be able to open the doors and connect you with their network of product managers to allow you to bridge the gap to get into the job. Because there will be certain product management roles which are a bit more junior that is looking out for cheaper labor, right? It sounds crap, but that is the case. There will be companies or startups that have a tighter budget like, okay, we'll just try this guy. 
and it, it will be fine, right? Just just learn as you go. I, I think that's the important thing. Alfonso, Vince or Akne? Yeah, so I would ask, so... Um, I think we're, we're both like, why would you want to do that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, why are you going to be a product manager? Why uh, ask that, that question, right? <laughs> I mean, you are you. You don't have to do. You don't have to hate yourself like we hate us ourselves, right? So you can you can <laughs> you can a say like, <laughs> live a happy life and and just deliver uh, every week without having to do twenty things and uh, at once at all times. So um, I think I mean it, it, this is product management. I don't know what's going to happen in ten or twenty years, but today there is no school for product management. There's a lot of people that try to to sell you a school for product manager. Uh, but I don't actually believe that that's kind of what, what, what it takes. I, I, I am kind of the quintessential, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm not the right person to comment because my career has been like the, the most typical one for product management is computer science uh, masters and then an MBA. So it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, but I didn't think about it that way, right? The way I learned uh, how to be a product manager was really because I had the opportunity uh, when I went back to school uh, for my MBA to actually work with a lot of startups and really uh, try to do stuff myself. And that's really, and, and be really involved with the startup ecosystem in London, going to a lot of meetups and uh, meeting a lot of uh, founders, work with them for free uh, during my, my studies as an intern, uh, like, like you were suggesting. And, and so basically, you know, like uh, um, these, these are really the, the way you learn on, on the streets, right? Because it's not some Thing which which today at least there is a real really proper school for but again i would really question uh, why is it that that it's something that because you know it's super fun i wouldn't change it for any other job but it's also very stressful and you don't switch off right it's not like it's uh, 7 p.m and going home right it's uh, it's something where where you're always on where where you know oftentimes you work uh, you work in evenings and weekends it's um you know if, if that's is that's your calling if that's what you enjoy by all means go for it and have a blast but but really be sure for what you wish for, right? Because you might get it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I echo that, right? So I think questioning your your motivations are really important. Uh, and speak to a therapist if you need to. Right? <laughs> but no, I, I think on a it sometimes looks glamorous to other people what we do, right? Because we're doing presentations and about metrics, but there is a whole world of pain that comes with it. So really understanding your role first, uh, understanding, um, you know, what the expects of it and deciding whether it's for you, right? Personality-wise, it's skills wise as well. Um, and, you know, if you're really interested in it, then I think uh, the best way to learn, it's really on the job itself. Uh, I think there are already actually academic degrees for product management now. Uh, they, 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 they spin those up very fast. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you are already a software engineer today, you're already in the right place, right? And you already are uh, set up for success in that you have interactions with uh, PMs around you. So, you know, go talk to them, you know, go try to get uh, know more of that work and make it known within your company, uh, you know, and see if there's a chance for you to transition from there. You know, we've had people in Grab, uh, engineers who transitioned um, to product managers and we've supported them. Um, so, you know, just really um, going out there and talking to uh, your fellow PMs, uh, trying to help them. And I think each point by getting a mentor is, is great as well. Uh, and then putting your hand up. And then really the only way to learn is just on the job itself. Um, and a, a lot of what other people do when they try to get into a junior PM role, right? Which is, you know, even if it's a boot camp, you know, at least it shows that, hey, you got serious about it. Uh, but reading up the same books, you know, doing the same interviews um, in order to get into the role. Yeah, and if I can add something practical, I think uh, echoing what Mincy just said, right? There was something that I read a, a, a few weeks back, which uh, which kind of came to mind when uh, when I was listening to Mincy, and uh, uh, this is this is basically a general advice, not just related to product manager, but related to any time of uh, any time you want to do like a different work, right? And if you have the chance to uh, access those people that are already doing that work, mm -hmm. it would be like you know. Tell me, go to them and ask, tell me what's the 20% of, of your job that you really hate and, and take it upon yourself to help them. That would, that would clearly really like a path to success because everyone I'm sure has a, has a part of their job that they really don't like. And, and to be able to offset it, basically you win two things, right? You win uh, the, 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 basically the rec, uh, reconnaissance of, of that of that work of that of the help you did to that person and they will try to help you back of course as much as they can but also at the same time you will win 
to th that you already know what's the worst part of the job. So you know exactly if, if that's for you. And if you can do the worst part, then everything else is an upside, right? So that, that maybe is a very practical approach to, to kind of get down that path. If you, if you work in an organization with a product manager, trust me, one thing that I can tell you for sure is that product manager will have some extra work. So <laughs> it's definitely something that, uh, that, that they can offset to you. And then if you can prove that you can deliver uh, on time uh, uh, for, for what you promise, then that, that would, I would say, clearly clears a path because the moment, like Mincy was saying, the moment there is an opportunity, a role for a product manager, for a junior product manager in the company, if a, a more senior person says, you know, uh, I think we should give this opportunity to this guy and he's, he's been helping me a lot lately and I think he can do it, that counts like uh, like a like a hundred points, right? So definitely, uh, that would that would be a, a great way to do that. Great. And actually, so you know, on since we were on the topic of like you know helping current PMs, um, I know do the twenty percent that they don't like, right? So someone, when an anonymous, actually asked, "What do you dislike most about being a PM?" <laughs> Where to start now? <laughs> um, I think that, that one thing that, that, that becomes, uh, one thing that I'm definitely not good at, uh, that, that I can definitely, that I wish I could learn, and, and that's why one reason why I don't really like so, so much how to do it is kind of, a lot of time, right, let's be honest, there is, as we said correctly earlier, right, there is a lot of stakeholders, especially in a, in a non-product driven organization, right, where there are business stakeholders, where there are other stakeholders, right, and a lot of time, a, a product manager has to kind of uh, prove, like, that the sun rises on the east, right, and that's something that really, really, like, kills me inside, right, for example, when I argue that, hey, you know, we should make this page faster because it's going to in increase click to rate and 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 when you say like prove it to me i was like oh okay fine but but basically you know um th th that's something that has been proven in uh, in uh, e-commerce for for 20 years right and so maybe this is something that i'm not particularly happy with when i have to really when my insights my my basically experience talking to customer my understanding of competition is not enough for me to to create a roadmap and I need to somehow please uh, a third party uh, with some sort of uh, invented statistics to show that that's exactly the first thing that we should do. That's something that I, I that's one part of the job that I, that I don't really find exciting. I feel like it should be, uh, you know, I, I really enjoy the, the part where I have to understand the customer needs. I have to work with user research. Uh, I have to make sure that the research is not like, um, um, putting my answer in in the mouth of the of the customer those are really things that I, I think it takes a lot of like uh, attention to detail but when it comes to like you know uh, tell me exactly what this thing is gonna have an impact in the next six months I haven't I haven't found yet someone that could really come up with a with a proper way a formula and then hit the target consistently right so that's something that I really don't enjoy about product management yeah I think I echoed Oh, sorry, go on. No, 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 go ahead. Yeah, I think I echo that. Uh, it says, and don't get me wrong, guys, I love my job. <laughs> That's why I'm still doing it. I mean, despite everything, uh, it proves that I'm a master case who loves pain. Um, but, you know, oftentimes there's no right answer in this world, right? You can run your experiments and at different times you will get different results. Um, so you go with one based on data, based on your gut, uh, based on experience, but then you have to defend it with your soul, right? So depending on the company's tolerance for failure, um, that could or could not work out well. Um, also, uh, it's, it's, it's contrary, but, you know, when you're a product manager, your key job is fully stakeholder management, right? How do you manage different opinions? How do you influence? How do you convince? Um, and that can get really tiring um, and sort of sometimes distracting you from creating impact, right? When all you want to do is to focus on users and ship good stuff, but hey, uh, and you know this as you go up to a certain level, you know, in management, sometimes it's just about managing egos <laughs> in the room uh, in the loudest voice, right? So. Mm -hmm. um, if you are in a situation where there's too many cooks uh, in the room, um, I think that can get a little bit tiring as a PM. Right. Um, how about it? Not a PM. Um, I don't have that on my title at all. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> 
But um, okay. I, I mean, to me, uh, dislike or like, uh, it's like having a spouse or a girlfriend or a boyfriend, right? There will not be a hundred percent whereby you will like or dislike the person. It is a choice that you have made. I think it is a choice that you will commit to. If at some point of time it doesn't make sense anymore, there's of course the, the ability to exit or divorce. So that, that's my take on it. I find a poison you're willing to eat, right? <laughs> I think that's what they yeah. say. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sorry? It's like, it's like, what are you, what's the pain that you're willing to eat every day uh, to put up with uh, the required? I think that's the same for that. Yeah, so the other analogy of, is, of course, boiling the frog. So most of the PMs are just stuck in the, bo- the pot being boiled. <laughs> well, it's like they were saying that, you know, which uh, shit sandwich are you willing to eat? Right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's like, um, we'll be moving on to the final two questions for tonight. And so is that we talked about what you, um, you know, what is probably like not the most favorite part of the job, but we also um, want to take a look at um, what um, you know what m- makes a good PM, and what are some like you know failures, what and what makes a bad PM. What are failure modes? What what do you mean by that? Um, so it's like I think maybe to rephrase the question, um, it's what, like how can a, uh, in what way will make a PM a failure, and what makes a PM a good PM? Okay. It's two different questions, but so yeah. I would say I would start by by uh, taking it a little bit like uh, from a, from a from a wider okay. angle, right? From a different perspective, right? Uh, uh, basically, it, it is said that there are more entrepreneurs in in the united states compared to germany because if you if you bankrupt in germany then you're in big trouble if you bankrupt in in silicon valley then you're a fantastic success and you're ready to start over again right so i would say uh, this is probably true also for product manager right it's it takes uh, it takes a lot of experience a good good amount of luck and uh, and a smart eye to distinguish a product manager who failed and learned from a product manager who failed and will fail again, right? And and I would say if you have that amount of ability to distinguish between the two, then then you are yeah then you are you know a, a great CEO or a great uh, CPO or or whatever is your whatever is the role, and then you definitely have to select for those a product manager that that fail and learn, right? I never quite understood how would you basically uh, one way that I look at it is like oh imagine for example. Uh, and this happened in every company, right? It happened in every single company I, I work with where you have some major mess up and, you know, maybe, for example, you didn't, you didn't require, require payment for a, for a while or something like that. And those things happen incredibly in incredible amount of time, right? It's quite shocking how often those things happen, right? And then I feel like, okay, you let this guy go and for sure this guy will, will be like... Uh, We'll never make this mistake again, right? So you're you're you 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 pay the money to make him learn the lesson, and you let him go so that he will apply that lesson somewhere else. So that's that's kind of crazy for me. Uh, so that 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 I would say definitely every failure, if you have the right mindset, is definitely a way for you to learn. And I think it really comes down to the company culture, but also the work culture. Uh, in one of my first jobs uh, back in the day. Uh, I actually was kind of the the uh, the um, uh, administrator of a bunch of servers that were used to send SMS between uh, between uh, mobile phone back when SMS was still in vogue, right? And uh, I, this kind of funny story happened that that uh, I was there as an intern, and my bu- my boss was in, on, on a business trip, and so uh, somebody a developer came to me and said, "Hey, you know, I need more space on the servers." And then it's a long story, but I'll try to make it very short. Long story short, I wiped down the entire test lab, right, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Nokia, which is not exactly a small company, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and so for like uh, a few days, the entire development team for, for SMS uh, was stopped, right? They couldn't work. And, uh, and I remember when my boss came back, I was obviously I was terrified, right? And I explained what happened. And he said, well, you know, uh, you there was no way for you to know because the, the, the software was not developed enough to give me a warning. So just don't make the same mistake. That's it. And that was the whole, whole the problem I got from that. 
And I can promise you that never happened again. And I made other mistakes, but def definitely not that mistake, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so to me, th this is kind of a, an important thing, right? You have to have the culture that allows for mistakes and, and allows you to own those mistakes and more importantly, share those mistakes, right? One other thing that I really don't understand is how certain companies keep those mistakes. Uh, uh, I, you know, they don't want to share them within the company because they're afraid that they will become public. That I understand. But at the same time, you know, you will then run the risk that another PM will actually uh, do the same mistake. So what, what we're doing, for example, what I'm trying to introduce uh, in the company that I work with is where basically product managers share their mistakes, right? And I think this is a super powerful thing uh, when you do it uh, uh, inside the company because I think you, you really... You really learn. And in Silicon Valley, I remember I went when I was, uh, when, I, when I lived there, I remember I, I went to a fail, fail something. There was a fail conference, right? Where people oh, were. Talk up nights? Sorry? Talk up nights? Yeah, no, I, I think it was kind of, kind of called fail something. And, um, and it was a conference about all possible failure. And I thought that was great. That was genius, right? Because it takes a lot of guts to talk about your failure, but you can learn so much more, right? I'm not gonna learn much if you say you're how smart you are, how, how good you are, and how much you got everything right. Because first of all, I know that that's not the real story. And second, because there is nothing to learn, right? Mm, the second part, true. what qualities make a good PM? Uh, I would say, I mean, that definitely you have to be very analytical. Uh, you have to be good with numbers. You have to be outspoken. You have to be willing to, to fight for what, for what you think is right. You have to be a step, definitely you have to be stubborn, uh, uh, and, but you also have to be smart enough to learn when to change your mind, right? So it's kind of that, that particular kind of a thin line where you, you have to protect your ideas, but also, you know, in Silicon Valley, they call it like, um, oh, there is an expression for that, now it's uh, elude me, uh, but basically it's, they, they, what, what they're trying to capture is that you have to be very strong with your opinion, very opinionated, as soon as you see evidence of the opposite, you also have to change your mind very rapidly, right? So you have to be very evidence-based, data-driven, read about uh, the, 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 the logic of, of, of what it is that you're thinking, bring it logic to the table. But then if somebody brings in new data uh, that, that, contra that contradicts what you said, verify the data. And if, if they, that data is correct, then you have to be ready to, to, uh, to change your mind. A lot of people say they have this expression of uh, check your ego at the door. I don't know how easy it is. But kind of the idea, it's kind of that, right? The, the idea is that at the end of the day, and I think uh, I'm getting better at it for sure. Like, uh, you know, probably in the past, I was probably more attached to, to my idea and trying to prove myself right. Now I, I'm, I'm much less interested about that. I'm much more interested about, okay, what's the right thing for the product? And how can we bring everybody and all their experiences together to make whatever uh, is best? And, right, and right. as a last note, right, I think this connect, connects to a lot of other things that we said in the past, right? You, you, if you want to be a product manager, if you want to become useful for the product manager on, on top of your development skills, then, then this is definitely something like be factual, bring, bring data, um, and, and help the product move in the right direction. And, and then you, you will definitely, you know, become more valuable uh, rather than your great value for from the development perspective right but if you want to move past that that value this is definitely the path to go okay um anybody has anything else to add oh, i i uh, quickly i think i want to add, uh so definitely failure to uh, learn from failures it's a failure in itself <laughs> uh, but objectively i mean for a company right as a pm you feel when you don't meet your uh, metrics, right? Uh, we're defined by our metrics and the impact that we deliver. Um, that's it though, on to the second question. You know, I've seen PMs who meet their metrics uh, at the expense of others. Uh, and I've also seen PMs who meet their metrics with others, if you know what I mean. So um, I think uh, we all have subjective opinions of good PMs, but um, the ones that I really enjoy working with are those that have a very strong product vision and they know how to get there, um, who can rally teams around them and build uh, trust and confidence in their stakeholders, uh, who's willing to go the mile, but also you know having their teams back. Um, so I think those are all really, uh, very strong leadership qualities um, that enable you to become a good product manager. Like, I mean, there are some people I, I would rather fail with some people than succeed with others, right? So <laughs> mm -hmm. you have to be that kind of role model uh, for your teams. Well, I think to me personally, diplomacy is something that is extremely important because uh, a product manager is still very much in the middle. So you have to manage up, you have to manage down uh, mm -hmm. as well as sideways. 
So the ability to, to be very diplomatic, but also not so politically correct that nobody likes you, right? So I think at one end of the spectrum, you might have Trump that nobody likes. And then the other end of the spectrum just sounds like, looks like a brown noser that sucks up to everybody that also nobody likes. So I think what's, what's quite important, at least what, what I feel is that, you know, there, there has to be a certain amount of authenticity that you bring to the role. People can trust, that trust is very important. And at the same time, if like Alfonso says, right, you build up enough credit, the credibility that that is extremely important capital that you can go and push forward your product when you, what you're trying to do. Um, the diplomacy, like say for instance, to talk to engineering team, to talk to design team, they also need to know and trust the fact that you have the best intentions at heart when talking to stakeholders. If they're not being, um, if they don't have representation there, you would be the one as the PM to represent them in that particular uh, situation. So I think it is, at least in, in, in the past experience I've had, that has been extremely important to make sure that credit is shared, to be diplomatic, to be authentic, and to be respectful for everybody, not only the bosses, the folks below doing the work, and also the peers. Arjuna, anything to add? Like maybe, um, like what do you, like from your experience working with like product managers, who, what qualities do the best ones have in your opinion? I think um, as like someone who constantly interfaces with product managers and who like takes uh, requirements to be delivered by the developers on the team, um, I agree with a lot of things that Nin mentioned. Uh, definitely someone who, um, you know, has gained the trust of the team, who's able to articulate the vision, who's able to make the team understand why we're building something and what are the like trade-offs. And even like when challenged, they are able to justify and articulate why the priorities are the way they are. So the people who um, we are able to talk and work well with, and those are the product managers that I've seen serving very well. Also mm -hmm. people who can be really tough on the engineering team, but also who have the back of the engineering team when there is trouble. Those are the product managers that, uh, you know, you, people really trust and enjoy working with. Right. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, so we'll just go to the last question. Um, maybe just like, which Inghao has asked. So um, as a final takeaway, is there one thing that you wish all software engineers know about like, your product manager or about like product managers? As a final takeaway for, for this. Uh, PMs are also human, right? <laughs> everybody, everybody is there to collect salary at some point. <laughs> okay, um, Minta. Yeah, I don't. I know it's a tough one. Uh, I don't. I mean, again, I can say this, but I'm coming out with uh, good interest, right? I don't know if anyone has to, you know, it's working with someone from the same place, but you know, we all. At the end of the day, we all, our goals are the same, right? Um, we want to deliver good products, we want to change user behaviors, and we want to do things that we're proud of. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't think there's one thing I wanted to know, but like, uh, you know, it's a tough job, and, and we're all trying to do our best. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I think yeah. what I would say is also, you know, be... Uh, you know, we, we all want you to be more involved uh, in the product development process. I think and that's what I really believe in product, product development. Um, and every time I hear feedbacks, opinions, new suggestions, I think that's the most joy a PM can have also. Like when your team is engaged and when you're all actively building um, for the same thing, right? So, um, yeah, if, if anything, that. Uh, actually, I was, I was thinking exactly along the same line, right? And I was going back to what, what I said about communication, right? So. It's very, very important for, uh, I mean, as Minsi said, right, uh, in, in reality, you know, uh, a product manager should not, I think most of the time, maybe a misunderstanding about the product management role is that the product manager is seen as the source of all inspiration, right? That should actually not be the case. Uh, and it should be, in fact, actually just a, a facilitator, right, where, you know, it helps kind of put things in perspective bring some experience, uh, collect the data, ask the right questions, but you shouldn't be the, 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 the one st stop shop for every, uh, everything that, the, that there is to change inside the product, right? And in fact, actually, uh, the, the ability of you know, collecting 
the right feedback from data, from user research, from other members of the team. Uh, that's really like one thing that the product manager really appreciate. So I think uh, my, uh, my suggestion is kind of uh, try to find the, 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 the right way to, to share more uh, feedback about the product uh, in, in, the, in the right way, in the, in the, in the, best, in the best possible way. Probably, uh, you know, like uh, sprint planning is not exactly the, 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 the greatest place uh, to, to, be, to be vehemently opposed. But there are other situations in which actually it's it's very very good to to kind of disagree because the idea is to get to the to the to the best possible solution, and communication again meaning that you know you have to like uh, the same way as product managers try to kind of understand more and be more productive, uh, speaking more of a technological uh, you know language and lingo. I think uh, uh, software engineer. Should really should really try to be more proficient in in speaking in, a, in in the same language of a product manager so that they both can meet in the middle. So that that would be my 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 takeaway. Right, and Archana. Um, so I'm not really a product manager, so I'm just going to think from the perspective of a software engineer. I think uh, I agree on what Alfonso just said. I think it's really important. Um, for you know like uh, the product and the tech to coexist because as like if the product teams if product managers understand uh, what technologies can bring to the table as soon as they understand what the product is and what they're building it's like a superpower that's been unleashed and together it's actually really effective but mm -hmm when there is not a high degree of trust or when information is not shared with engineers, that's when we see a lot of conflicts and a back and forth uh, about what's being built and a lot of like issues and conflicts. Um, so for me as a software engineer, I would like my product managers to be really open and transparent with me and share the product vision and, you know, treat me as a peer so that uh, my ideas are valued and together we build the product together. Right. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, Minsu H, uh, Arkana, and also Alfonso. And so it's like, it's really enjoyed the sharings by every one of you. And I hope everyone else who has tuned in also enjoyed it. Um, so it's like we've come to the end of the panel. I'd really like to thank everyone for taking the time um, to kick off this week with this panel. And thank you so much. I hope everyone has learned something. Uh, I hope the panels also have learned something from each other as well. And I enjoyed, I enjoyed it. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, uh, just so you know, this is, going, this is recorded and it should be uploaded quite soon. So if you want, you can, uh, you can share the link um, of the video with your peers who have probably missed this. And thank you so much for coming. Um, hope you enjoy the evening. Good night. Hey everyone, just before you sign off, I have just posted a link to a feedback form in the chat. If you could help us with some feedback, we'll also post it on the meetup and Facebook events so that you have access to it outside of this Zoom meeting. But we'd really appreciate it if you could give us some feedback. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.